Hi everyone, it's Katie from The Clark. We're gonna get started here in about eight minutes, so I just want to give people some time to log in. Um, I have a couple little things I gotta finish setting up, so in the meantime, I'm gonna take a look at this basket that we'll be working with today, and we'll be starting right at two o'clock. Ready. Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we'll be getting started in about five minutes here. Um, just giving everyone a little bit of time to log in. Um, and then, yeah, so welcome to today's Ask the Curator. If you have any you know, pre-existing questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat box or the chat question comment box. Um, and I'll try to answer them during the, the live cast. I should be able to see them um, when you ask them. So, um, in the meantime, let you take a look at this basket. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about who made it, where it's from, and what kind of work we're going to be doing on it today um, in the live cast. So, stay tuned. You can also hit the share button um, to. You know, invite your friends to also tune in. Um, this video will also be posted on our website within the next week and it'll be available on Facebook um, after the live cast ends as well for those who aren't able to tune in when it's happening. So give people a couple more minutes and I'll be back.
have about two minutes here until we get started. Um, for those of you tuning in, my name is Katie. I'm the interim director curator at the Clark Museum. Uh, today we're doing a video called Ask the Curator. It's our weekly Friday, uh, Friday at 2 p.m. video. Um, and if you have any questions during the video, you can ask them in the comments and I can see them and I'll try to answer them during the video. If not, um, when we're done with our demonstration, I'll try to answer them then. So feel free to ask throughout the presentation. Um, yeah, and today we're going to be checking out um, some of the maintenance and care for our basket collection. Um, and I'll be doing a little demonstration using this basket. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the basket, who made it, where it's from. Um, and yeah, so um, feel free to share and invite your friends to also view this video. And we'll go ahead and get started here in a minute. All right, so it looks like it's just about two o'clock here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the video. I'm Katie, I'm the Interim Director Curator here at the Clark Museum. Um, and I've worked here for about three years. It'll be three, I think, in September. Um, so today we're gonna be checking out some of the maintenance and care for our baskets. And I'll be doing a demonstration using this basket on some of the um, kind of tools we use and uh, methods we use to help preserve our baskets for years in the future. So first thing, we'll talk a little bit about this basket. So this is a hopper basket. Um, it's from the Hover collection. Notice it has a hole in it. So the way these baskets are used is that they're put on top of a rock um, and then you use a um, stone hand tool to grind up acorns. Um, and having kind of this hopper shape on top of the rock keeps the acorns from flying out. So how these baskets are made, just a little quick introduction, is that this bottom part is actually woven in um, using an open weave and sticks. And then once the basket, all the sides and everything are completed, the bottom is taken out. So I've asked, I've heard from people um, who have asked if this is a basket made for something else and then just retrofitted to be a hopper basket. Maybe the bottom broke out or something like that. But no, these baskets are specifically made um, to be used as hopper baskets. And a lot of our hopper baskets also have these kind of reinforced edges with the braided sticks. Um, some of them have designs, some of them are pretty plain. It kind of depends on who was making it. So there's kind of a view of this. And I'm just gonna step over to the computer really quick so I'm sure I get this information right. But just a little bit information on this basket specifically, who made it, when it was made. Um, so I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see this, but this is our computer program. Um, it's called Pass Perfect. Let me see if maybe I can Get it so you can actually see it a little bit. Oh, come on. There we go. So, okay, well, that view is not very good. But anyway, so it's a way for us to keep track of our baskets and our um, other items in the collection. So, this is from the Hover collection, which was, don which was purchased by the museum in 1983. Um, this specific basket was made. Um, sometime before 1900. It's made of bear grass, maidenhair fern, spruce root, and hazel sticks. The design is called spread hand design. I just saw that question pop up, so there you go. Um, it was made by a Karuk weaver named Emma Perch. Um, and if you want to know the dimensions, it's a little over five inches by 14, almost 15 inches. Let me check, see if you can hear us. Yeah, okay. There's that. 
And so usually when this item is on display, you'll see it in the hover case, which is in one of kind of the corners of Nilas Hall. It recently got a facelift uh, this past winter. But we took it off display because there was a little bit of maintenance that we had to do on it. So let's take a look here. So kind of the first thing we look for when we're looking at baskets, um, particularly are spots that might have mold on them. So of course we live in Humboldt County, mold is everywhere. There's kind of no avoiding it. Um, and you know, mold's kind of, I guess, mission in existence is to break things down into smaller nutrients that can be reused by, reused by other things in the environment. So mold is doing what it does. It attaches to natural fibers like basket materials and starts decomposing things, which of course you don't really want in a museum. Okay, so it looks like I need to speak up. Okay, um, let me see real quick. Okay, so I have kind of a funny setup here. I literally have my phone taped to a light stand. So um, hopefully I can speak a little louder um, let me know if, if I need to talk louder. Um, okay, so mold is something that's pretty common and pops up. We do what we can to reduce the humidity um, and keep the temperatures really stable in the museum to prevent mold from growing, but it does still grow. Okay, cool, you guys can hear me. Okay, thanks. All right, so a lot of times when we had to take items off display, it's because of mold and we need to just clean them up and then we can put them on display. Sometimes we do have to isolate them a little bit um, if the problem is considerable, um, but most of the time we just have to clean them up a little bit and they'll be okay. So when looking at a basket and you're looking for mold, it kind of pops up as this like fuzzy kind of stuff. So there's some right here and it, it might be kind of hard to see here because I'm using my phone. so. Um, hopefully I can kind of point it out to you guys. Um, it's kind of hard to see. So it's right here. Um, you'll notice it's a, it's a little bit gray. It kind of looks a little fuzzy. Um, if you've seen mold around your house, it might look like this as well. Um, but if you're taking a quick glance at things, you might not really see it. So there's that little mold spot there. So I'm taking a look for that kind of stuff. Um, so that'll be something we'll have to clean up and sometimes you know, there's a little bit here. Um, part of what helps the mold grow as well is um, dust on the basket. So it's really important that items get swapped out of displays. They're not sitting and getting dusty because otherwise it creates a really good environment for that mold to grow. All right, so and actually now that I'm really looking really looking close at this basket. I can even see spots where there's kind of hair poking through, which is kind of interesting. Um, I'm not exactly sure why there's hair poking through, but for now I'm gonna leave that there. Um, in some items, and not usually on baskets, but sometimes on dresses and things like that that are kind of mixed materials, sometimes there might be bug infestations, like if there's pine nuts that aren't cleaned out all the way. Bugs will get into the pine nuts and kind of eat at them. So sometimes those need to get cleaned out. Sometimes there are past bug infestations that might have affected the basket before it came to the museum that sometimes there's little bug kind of pockets or carcasses that need to get taken out. But it looks like on this basket that isn't really the case, which is good. Okay, we're in Old Town. There's weird sounds outside the building right now so that happens okay um so let's see i've got those couple mold spots there we'll check the inside as well let's take a look and i'm using this bright light because it kind of helps to highlight spots where there might be dirt or mold that might need to get cleaned out this person's really hammering away at something out there okay um so something else i kind of want to point out in here right there um, it might be really hard to see because it's actually written very small, but that's the accession number for this item. So that's the number that we type into our database that lets us know what this item is, who made it, where it came from, all that good stuff. 
And those are kind of hidden on all of our items um, so we can keep track of everything. All right. So let me find that. Okay, here's one of the mold spots. Again, this one's kind of smaller than the other one. Um, but one of the things we do is we have this kind of wand thing. It's got a light bulb on it. And so this is a UV light wand. So um, what it does is it's got a light bulb. It's got some UV light. You hit the button and there's UV light that comes out of the light bulb. Simple enough. So what the UV light does is you have to get it really close to the mold spores, hold it over it for a couple seconds. And the idea is that it's supposed to kill the mold spores. And there are scientific studies to kind of back this up. Um, and of course, you know, especially in museums, one of the things we're always concerned about is you don't want a lot of UV light hitting your items. Otherwise, you can get a lot of fading that happens. But when it comes to this, this is very concentrated and limited UV light. So it's not going to have that long-term sustained damage that, um, you know, regular sunlight is going to have. This is just to kill the mold spores and then we turn it off and continue along. So what we usually do with this is we'll definitely put it over the spots that are definitely moldy, but we'll also kind of wave it over the rest of the item as well. Um, just in case there are other mold spores that we can't see, we can try to just kill as many of them as we can. And then we'll go along to the next step. So I'll do that really quick. And this is kind of an interesting tool because if you tilt it too much up, it actually turns off because UV light is not good to get in your eyes or on your skin. So um, that's kind of a safety feature this has, but it kind of makes it a little bit difficult sometimes <laughs> to, um, to use it, especially with 3D objects. So let's take a look at this. All right, so the UV light is on. Have it over the mold spot. Two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi, seven Mississippi, eight Mississippi, nine Mississippi, ten Mississippi. Okay. Now we're gonna just go slowly over this. Kind of the whole thing. And one of kind of the cool things about this particular aspect of the job is that it helps you. It you get a really up close and personal look at these baskets and these items. Um, and it can be uh, really eye-opening to be able to see them this close. Um, okay. Okay. Put down like this. Oh, turn back on. Okay. I'm try to situate it. Like this. Okay. There we go. All right, so that's mold spot number two right here. Okay. You can imagine this takes quite a bit of time with larger baskets um, as well. Yeah, usually when I'm doing this, um, I usually have some music playing or listening to a podcast or something like that. Um, okay. And the thing with UV light is you have to hold it really close. Um, because, of course, light rays, as they move through uh, air, they kind of dissipate a bit. So you have to have it really close for it to get the maximum effect. Okay, so we're almost back around here. So we have a question that says, what am I, what are you doing? Are you measuring, well, oh, nope. Uh, let me 
I see. So I, I can't see the rest of your question, but I'll answer the first part. Oh, okay. So um, I'm using a UV light to uh, kill the mold spores that are on this basket. Um, usually when we first accession items into the collection, we'll measure them and put those measurements in past perfect. Um, and then, so this is also not only killing the mold spores that we can see, but also the ones that are harder to see or that we can't see at all. Okay. Tilt this. There we go. Doo -doo -doo. I feel like I'm in CSI whenever I'm using this thing. <laughs> Okay. There we go. Okay. So now we've kind of scanned this whole basket with the UV light. So we can put that aside. There we go. All right. So the next thing is um, I get to use these goggles and a mask to vacuum it. Okay, so uh, we got a question, will the UV light kill the mold? That's the idea, is that it kills the mold spores. All right, so I'm actually going to put this on first because it's hard to put a mask on over goggles. So I've got my handy dandy N95 mask. We've been using these very sparingly lately um, because of the COVID and everything that's been going on. Um, we're trying to preserve them as much as we can. So of course these help keep out any mold spores that might fly off or other materials um, from getting into my lungs. Uh, of course you don't want to inhale mold spores, it's not very good. I wear the goggles also to kind of keep that away from my eyes. Okay. Okay. So. I see another question. I'm going to go ahead and answer that one after this next step. So um, we have this vacuum, which you can't really see all of it because it's sitting on the ground. But um, it's actually a pharmaceutical grade vacuum. So whenever it you know, vacuums things up, it has a special HEPA filter that'll keep those little particulates from flying back in the air. Because of course, that's the last thing you want is mold and other kind of um, you know, pieces of matter flying into the air after you take it off the basket. You don't want it flying around everywhere. So we got this vacuum. And the cool thing about this is that it has a variable kind of suction power. So you can either have it go in full force or you can have it only um, pulling a little bit. Um, so uh, if you're using a speaker or headphones right now. This vacuum can be a little loud, so you might want to turn down your volume um, so it doesn't, you know, blast your eardrums. So I'll give you a second to do that. Um, another part of this is we have a brush here. So what we do is we kind of use this to brush any kind of dirt or particulates off of the basket. And we have the vacuum really close by, so when things are dislodged from the basket, it'll get sucked up into the vacuum. You don't really want to take the vacuum bristles and you know scrub the side of the basket or anything because if there's any materials that are sticking out, like um, overlays or things like that, it could damage them. So you gotta be really careful. Um, and this is a pretty stable basket, which is good. So that helps a lot too. Okay, so if you're using or headphones, you might want to turn down a little bit just because of the vacuum cleaner. I'll go ahead and start um, where is that part that I am looking for? Okay, 
So I'm gonna start here. Of course, baskets are round, so sometimes I kind of forget where I'm at. So I'm gonna start here, where you can kind of see the strengthening band begins and ends, so then I don't forget where I'm at. Okay, so here we go, it's vacuum time. All right, so put this thing over my shoulder, just so it kind of stays out of the way and doesn't bump into anything I don't want it to bump into. Come on. It's got a very long hose, so it can be a little unwieldy sometimes. Here we go, okay. Alrighty, there we go. Okay, so I'm adjusting the interception. And here we go. So that was a particular spot where there was a big mold spot there, so I wanted to really get in there. Okay. Let's continue along.
always kind of makes my neck hurt a little bit. All right. Okay. So, vacuuming's done. So, let's see. There was someone who asked a question here. Let me see that really quick. If it lets me see. Okay. I read that some museums wrap basket in plastics and they pre place them in a deep freezer to kill mold and insects. Is this a good idea? Yes, that's actually a pretty common practice um, to do that. It's a great way to kill mold. Um, it's, you know, it's more effective than the UV light because it does really kill the mold um, by freezing it. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a, a deep freezer here. Otherwise, we would definitely be doing that. Um, that works for all kinds of things. It does work for baskets. It works for books. It works for all kinds of um, items. So that is a, um, one of the practices people use. So, okay. And thank you, uh, Patrick, for Robert and donating. I just saw that. Thanks, guys. Okay. So now I'm going to do a quick another visual check just to be sure I got all the mold spots I kind of pointed out a little bit earlier. And there was one point in time I was kind of using this smaller brush just to really, this has a little bit stiffer bristles on it. So just it helps me kind of get a little more into the, the weave of the basket there. So I'm going to take a look at everything, see how it's looking. And so there is, okay, we're looking good. So we'll take another look, see here. So this is kind of a cool basket. It's got um, some overlay going on with it. That's what this kind of, it's funny because in this light, it actually looks a little reddish. I don't know if you guys can really see it on there, but this Woodwardia fern um, is a little bit reddish. Usually it shows itself as black, but this might just be also just the lighting or something. Um, okay. I forgot how much these N95 masks make my face really sweaty. Um, but it's better than breathing in mold spores, so, you know. Okay. Oh, I might do a little bit more work on this one spot here. Let me get this, get this up and running. Put my goggles on. Oh, a little foggy. Okay. Let me go. A little bit more. So I just wanted to check the inside of the basket on that spot where there was some, it was a mold spot. So kind of vacuumed a little bit on the inside there. Okay, that's looking. That is looking good. Okay, cool. All right. Cool. So that's kind of our basic taking care of this basket um, when it comes to cleaning it up a little bit. Um, let me take these goggles and masks off. Here we go. Okay. So for some items, okay. So for some items, um, like I mentioned, um, uh, like dresses that have pine nuts on them, um, sometimes when the inside of the pine nut isn't cleaned out all the way, bugs will get in there and kind of eat stuff. Or sometimes there might be bugs that there was a previous bug infestation on a basket and there might be little bug bits kind of stuck in the weave. Um, we'll actually use these dental tools to kind of carefully take things out that aren't supposed to be in there. Um, 
in fact, this sometimes this uh, process of vacuuming and cleaning the baskets feels like dental work because <laughs> um, you really got to get in between little you know spaces and things like that. Okay, there's a little fuzzy thing on it. Um, that was not mold; it was just fuzz. Um, so we'll use these different dental tools to kind of get things out. Um, this one, you'll notice, kind of has some glue on it. This is one of the tools we use when we're applying those accession numbers that we use to keep track of um, items. So that's why it has glue on it. Um, this one we don't usually use for picking things out. Um, let me see, what other tools do we kind of have? We have all these different paint brushes that'll help us kind of dust things off. Um, also have a handy dandy magnifying glass du, du, du. a little spooky okay um, so anyway those are some of the tools that we use in uh, maintaining our collections um, as you can tell it kind of took even without me talking it kind of took a little bit to process this entire basket um, and we have hundreds of baskets and different regalia items and stuff that need constant upkeep so it's a big job we do um, have a position for someone to work specifically in Neelis Hall doing exhibits, maintaining baskets, doing inventories, things like that. Um, if you or you know someone who might be interested in doing a job like that, we do have the job open right now. Um, our fabulous Neelis Hall curator, Brittany, um, left a little earlier in the year to go work over at HSU, so now she's kicking butt over there. Um, so we are looking for another Neelis Hall curator. So that job posting is on our website. If you go to our website, you click on About Us, or About, I think is what the tab is, and then you go scroll down to Staff and Board, and then scroll down to the bottom of that Staff and Board page, you can apply. So, okay, so I'm going to um, scoot over. Actually, I'm, I'll just scroll here, and I'll try to get some of those earlier questions. Let me just, so I'm going to awkwardly stare at the phone really quick okay so freezer one got that one um we got questions can you talk about the tribe's use of the baskets too you loan them out for ceremonies etc some can only be handled by uh men okay yeah so let's see so um the museum does have a regalia loan program so right now it's on hold um we have to do some evaluations on um, items that can be loaned out, the care of the items that can be loaned out, um, and kind of that whole process. So that's on hold right now. But historically, we have loaned out um, certain regalia items to be danced in dances. Um, and so we're trying to maintain this balance of preserving these items for the future, for future makers, for future people to study, um, for future Native people to interact with. Um, but we're also trying to balance the spiritual need of these items. So the idea is baskets and regalia items are living. They're made out of living materials, so they're living beings in themselves. Um, so they have um, certain spiritual requirements. So um, one of those things is not specifically for this basket, but for things like headdresses, um, actual dresses, necklaces, caps, things like that, they're supposed to be danced. That's part of their life cycle. Um, so it's really important that we understand and maintain that. Um, so that's why we have this regalia loan program. And right now we have the Nilas Hall Committee, which is made up of tribal representatives from, I think, almost all the tribes of this area, um, and an equal balance of men and women. And they're going through our collections and figuring out which items um, can be danced, which items shouldn't be danced. Um, and trying to figure out how exactly the requirements for that are going to work. So that's a work in progress. Um, keep an eye out for that. Um, and uh, let's see. Okay, so the next question. Okay. Okay, so there are certain items that um, kind of cultural rules dictate are supposed to only be handled by men. And a lot of those are kind of ceremonial items, so things, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. There's um, gambling drums, which are kind of these big square drums that are used during gambling games. Um, I think I've, um, things like jump dance baskets, so those are um, kind of these 
rectangular but also kind of teardrop shaped baskets so they're they're kind of woven as a mat by a woman and then they're finished by a man but they're only supposed to be handled by men once they're completed um there are other items too those are just kind of the two that come to mind immediately um so we do our best to also abide by those kind of cultural rules as well and everyone's kind of got a different reason why there those rules exist but we abide by them um, whenever possible. Okay, so I think that kind of covered that one. What's the background on the basket, date, origin, etc.? So yeah, okay. So this basket, I'll just kind of recap a little bit. So this was made by Emma Perch um, sometime before 1900, um, and it's part of the Hover collection, which was purchased by the museum in the 80s and is in a special display here in the hall. Um, and the Hover collection is a basket collection that was compiled by um, weavers for many decades. It was on display um, at, oh man, which hotel was that? I can like see it. Is it the Requa Inn? I can see it. It's on the Klamath. Um, but it was on display there. And I think there was a fire and there was one point in time they had to throw baskets out the window so they wouldn't be burned. And that's how we have some of them. Um, but it's a really gorgeous collection. It's an incredible collection. And part of it is always on display here at the museum. And we rotate, we rotate out items as well. Um, so most of the time when you come in, you see a different basket or a different basket kind of layout in that collection. But it's not just baskets. There are other items as well. There's necklaces. There's one that um, it's a brush used when processing acorns. So there are other items besides just baskets in the Hover collection. Okay. Um, okay, we got that one. Let's see. Okay, so we have a question. How do the gender rules for handling apply to a two-spirit person, gender fluid, for example? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I'm actually not sure. That is worth looking into. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm not really sure. Um, but I'd be interested to see what different folks kind of have to say on that. Um, because, yeah, these rules do differ from tribe to tribe, but they also differ from community to community, even within the same tribe. And that was something that um, when Brittany worked here, she always kind of brought that up where these relatives say this, but then, you know, hear, you hear this from other tribes and, you know, um, so it's kind of a, we're always learning something when it comes to working with these baskets, working with the collections and working with the communities that these baskets come from and, you know, regalia items and all kinds of other things. Okay. Can you talk about the classes or things you are doing to teach basket making in the next generation? I think maybe Brittany was working on that. Okay. So we have done basket weaving classes in the past. I'm just going to scoot this basket a little bit. Actually, I'll rotate this. Okay. So in the past, um, before I started working here, there were classes on basket weaving that we had here at the museum, um, but we haven't done those in a long time. And part of that has to do with the amount of time it takes to collect materials. It can take an entire year to collect materials for basket weaving um, because you have to collect based on the time of year and when different things are blooming or sprouting or things like that. Um, so it's a lot of work and a lot of time on the part of the person who's teaching weaving. Um, so we haven't done them here, but there are different cultural organizations within different tribes that are doing that kind of thing currently. Um, they're pretty much, from what I know, kind of just open to people that are in that tribe. Um, so that's kind of my knowledge on it. Um, when it comes to projects that we're working on here at the museum, um, there is a project that Brittany started and was kind of working with the Seraptimists on, but then the pandemic happened and it's kind of it's still happening, but it's just not happening as fast as it was going to. Um, but we have a number of uh, ceremonial aprons that have been donated over time to the collection. And so if you're not familiar with um, dresses and aprons when it comes to ceremonial use, um, there is two parts. So there's the skirt, which kind of wraps around the back, and then there's the apron, which sits in the front. So it's a two-piece dress. Um, so... We do have some 
aprons that were donated without a skirt. And I think we have one skirt that was donated without an apron. Um, so sometimes that could be someone purchased it that way. Sometimes an apron might have been made just kind of as a demonstration piece, like here's how you make an apron, like teaching someone else how to do it. Um, and then other times we're just not really sure why we only have, you know, one piece but not the other. So Brittany went through and with the Nealis Hall Committee and picked out an apron that didn't have a skirt and was not restricted by the donor in terms of it can only remain in the museum. We, are, we do have some collections where the donor, donors stipulate that the baskets or the regalia items or whatever they are cannot leave the museum. And there's reasons for that, but I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, so we found a dress or an apron that didn't have a skirt and was allowed to go out. So what we were going to do was we were going to make a skirt that goes with the apron and then that dress can be danced. So it would go into that regalia loan program I mentioned a little bit ago. Um, so we have um, on our board, there's a one of our board members named Rachel. She works for the Trinidad Rancheria. Um, and she's also a dressmaker. So she and Brittany sat down and figured out the supplies we were going to need to make this dress or to make this skirt to go with the apron. Um, and it was something like, so the, the apron which I think I've shown off in different videos, and we're gonna be doing a video specifically on this project um, for the birthday celebration in August, so keep an eye out for that. Um, but um, one of the things was, they kind of estimated how many pine nuts they were gonna need to go with the apron, because the apron has a lot of pine nuts on it. And it was something like 2,000 pine nuts, <laughs> which pine nuts are, you know, about that big. They're, you know, not very big. Um, and not only do you need the pine nuts, but you need to cut the ends off of them and you need to clean out the inside so bugs don't eat them, like I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, and then you got to string them and there's bear grass stuff and there's abalone and all kinds of things. So it's going to be a, a long time project. And now that the pandemic's happened, we haven't really been able to work on it as much uh, because we can't get groups of people together to work on stuff. So um, it's a little delayed right now. Um, but that is a project that's going on and that would tie into that regalia loan program and ensuring that the spiritual life of these items continues, um, even while, you know, they're here at the museum. Um, so I think that was that. So yeah, and basket weaving is, um, a thing that's being taught still. It didn't just you know, stop. Um, even in times when materials were hard to access, basket weaving in some way was still going on. Um, and sometimes, you know, it, particularly in our baskets and design um, exhibit that we have going on downstairs, which I need to do a walkthrough tour of that one because I don't think I've done that one yet. Um, you know, these basket designs were still preserved in a different medium, which was um, pottery. There was this group called the Hoopa Pottery Guild um, that did pottery and painted local um, basket designs on them to preserve those designs until a time when it would be more accessible to get weaving materials, which now it's, it's easier. It's still not super straightforward, but it is easier than it was, you know, even a couple decades ago. And if you want to learn more about that, um, there's a group called SEBA, California Indian Basket Weavers Association. Um, they've done programs in the past called um, Following the Smoke that kind of talks to different um, like land operators, so things like the national parks, the state parks, the BLM, private landowners, things like that, about the importance of um, being able to continue to collect basket weaving materials for basket weavers. So, um, so keep an eye on them. They have lots of information on that. Um, and it's a really like fascinating project that they're working on to create more awareness of the need for being able to collect basket materials, needing to collect safe basket materials. So things that haven't been treated with pesticides or other kind of agents, um, and having them be accessible to different people. So that's something really fun. I recently learned a little bit more about that. Um, so I definitely recommend, uh, checking it out more about that. So let's see, it's 2.46. So I'm going to scroll through, see if we have any questions. Any more questions going on? Hope I didn't miss anything from anyone earlier. Um, oh, 
Okay. Yeah, okay. I think that kind of sums it up. If anyone has more questions, feel free to post them here. I'm going to check. Um, uh, I actually have this video also streaming in a different Facebook group, so I'm just going to check to see if there are any questions from that group, and I'll just kind of answer them for everyone. So I will be right back. Let me check real quick. So, I'll turn this here. You can see me in delay, which is kind of funny. Okay, so we have some questions. So Christina says, fascinating, I love that museum. Was there years ago, would love to learn how to make those. I do some artifacts, but not baskets. You're doing great, sounds perfect. Just can't see the computer due to glare, but that's okay. <laughs> cool. Um, let's see. So you were also wondering where you could get these lights. Um, and then if we can see the filter after showing how many particles were collected. Okay, so the light I'm using is actually just kind of a floor lamp that has three light bulbs on it. <laughs> um, it's not particularly high tech, but the bulbs are super bright. Um, I'm not sure if that's helpful at all. Um, and I'm not sure where this light came from. Um, chances are someone donated it to us. Um, but I think I've seen lights like this at Target. Um, but yeah, and I think these are fluorescent bulbs that are not LEDs or anything like that. Um, and then also for the for the filter, okay, so actually I'll use this chance to, okay, I'm going to unstick my phone from the lamp. I do have a tripod coming, which will be really nice. Okay, <laughs> you can see how it was kind of stuck on there using tape. Hands-free device, high tech, okay. So this is that vacuum cleaner that I mentioned. So the filters on these, you know, unless you use it every day, you don't actually have to replace the filter all that often because they're just that nice. Um, so I have never actually replaced this filter. I'm not sure how to do it. Um, we do have an information book on it, but since we don't use it every day, we haven't had to empty the filter. So. Um, you can't really see here much of anything, but, um, yeah, so that's kind of, it's kind of a funny little vacuum. It's got wheels on it. Um, it can just follow you around. Um, but yeah, so one of the things we've talked about in the past that we haven't talked too much about recently because COVID makes everything kind of difficult, um, is doing whoops okay we're good nothing broke okay so one of the things we've talked about in the past and i think this will probably be my last thing because i gotta i gotta go someone's gonna replace one of the windows in the museum here um one of the things we've talked about in the past is doing a workshop or some kind of informational series on how individuals who own baskets or own different items or antiques or things like that can care for their items um, using kind of museum standards, but being able to make them happen in a way at home. You know, because not these uh, pharmaceutical vacuums are not that usually accessible to most people. So um, that's something that we've kind of been talking about, and particularly now because there are all these video outlets for sharing that kind of information. I just kind of thought I'd throw the idea out there if anyone would be interested in how to kind of preserve your heirlooms at home as a video series kind of thing done here by the museum. If that's something that sounds interesting to you, you can toss it in the comments, let us know. Um, it's definitely something I can do for future Ask the Curators. So if there is interest in that, definitely feel free to let me know. Um, so the last thing I'm going to do with this basket, and I probably won't do it while filming because it's not particularly exciting, is I'm going to go on to Pass Perfect and I'm going to update the condition status of this basket. Um, there's a little spot on there that says, you know, when was their last, you know, maintenance kind of thing going on. And then you know what you did, if there was any, you know, breakage or anything that you noted before um, or while you were working or if anything happened to break while you were working on it. That does happen. Sometimes there might be a piece that you don't notice is broken until it just kind of boop and falls off, um, which would definitely try to avoid that. But it does happen. Things are old. So... That's going to be the last thing I'm going to do here, and then I'll go ahead and put this basket away. 
Um, so thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, I hope you learned something new. That's kind of the idea behind all of these. Thank you for all the great questions. Um, if you have any future questions, you know, you can definitely drop them in the comments here. You can send us an email, admin, A-D-M-I-N, at clarkmuseum.org, and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, if you enjoyed this video or had a good time or learned something new and feel generous, you can definitely feel free to donate. Looks like we've had two people donate um, during this video feed. We greatly appreciate it, particularly because we've been closed for such a long time, um, and we're very excited to still be able to serve everyone while we're closed, you know, in a modified way. So with that, I'll go ahead and log out for today. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you all next week. I believe next week is Trivia Week, so definitely be sure to tune in. If you happen to answer the most questions right, you get a membership to the museum, or if you have a membership already, you can pass it on to a friend or a family member. They make great gifts. Um, and we will see you next week. Have a good weekend. Have a good next week. Uh, happy end of July and happy beginning of August. We'll see you then.